So it's great to be here. It's been a wonderful, very interesting uh, uh, conference thus far. I want to take things in a bit of an, a, a newer direction, of course, in the same theme of nanoscale optics. Um, I'm going to talk about metallic nanoparticles, and we will start with gold nanoparticles. And gold nanoparticles have a wonderful and storied history. I'm sure many of you might be aware of this from your, even from your high school textbooks, you find out things about gold nanoparticles. They were, of course, the beautiful red color that you see in stained glass windows in the, for, formed in the Middle Ages, and even earlier in, uh, if you look at this beautiful goblet that's found in the British Museum, the beautiful red color is basically because gold nanoparticles are embedded in the glass. Gold, because of its collective electronic resonance or plasmon resonance, absorbs green light and therefore it transmits the complementary color. So the birth of modern optics or classical electromagnetism we can relate to Michael Faraday, of course, for providing the experiments that set up Maxwell's equations that, 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 that elucidated uh, that enabled uh, Maxwell to uh, derive his equations. <clears throat> he was interested both in light scattering and in nanoparticles. He was both an optics, optical scientist, if you can say that, that, that being the case in that early era, and a chemist. And he made gold nanoparticles. He was also a great public speaker. So this vial of uh, this, this, this large vessel is actually the gold nanoparticles that he made. They are stable. They are still in the British Museum of Science and Technology, just as he made them more than 100 years ago, about 150 years ago. And uh, you can see also that they have, still have uh, retained this beautiful red color, which is due to the plasmon resonance of metallic nanoparticles. So when we talk about the way in which a, a, a metallic nanoparticle or a plasmonic nanoparticle in, particle interacts with light, if, you're, if the light is off resonance, this is basically the pointing vector of a plane wave incident on a on, in this case, an aluminum sphere, <clears throat> when it's off resonance, you see that, that it does not interact at all with the, um, with, the, with, the, with the nanosphere. But on resonance, you see that literally light from relatively far away from the nanoparticle is bent around and interacts very strongly with the nanoparticle. So we can literally, you can tell just by this interaction, we can, we, th these are, are clearly at, at our antennas. Right? They connect the near field to the far field, so it's a good definition of an antenna, but they're antennas that operate at optical frequencies, and they're controlled by that plasmon resonance. <coughs> so we can think of a plasmon resonance as a sloshing of electrons driven, just a harmonic oscillator, as we talked about, uh, yeah, as, as Thomas mentioned earlier uh, in, this, in, in, in this symposium. <coughs> we can think of this as a collective electronic resonance at, this, at, at an optical frequency, and as I showed you, for a sphere, we have, uh, we have a one well-defined resonance. If I take that sphere and I stretch it, then I have two resonances. So I can excite either the electrons that oscillate on the long axis of a nano rod, or in, in which case they would have a lower energy, or I can, I can excite the electrons on the shorter uh, axis of the nano rod, in which case they would have a higher energy. But this shows you a very simple and very powerful principle, and that is if I change the shape of a metallic nanoparticle, I can control its optical properties. I can control the wavelengths of light that this particle can absorb. <laughs> and so, really quite some time ago, we began to play with this concept, and we began to look at a very simple variation of a sphere. Instead of a solid sphere, we developed a hollow sphere called a nanoshell. We called it a nanoshell. <laughs> so when you, add, uh, this sol when you add this hollow core, to this structure, what you do is you've created a tuning rod, a, tuni a tuning knob, excuse me. And so if you can control the inner and outer radius of the shell, you can then control the color with which this nanoparticle will absorb light. So rather than absorbing light for at, at, at green wavelengths, now you can absorb light further across the optical spectrum and well and, and, and into the infrared. <clears throat> so this is actually, we can connect up how the, the how plasmon resonances of complex structures uh, are designed and how and, and their energies by relating this to basically as a semi-classical analog of very simple quantum systems. So just as we know about how 
atoms with their atomic states mix and hybridize by the rules of quantum mechanics to form molecular orbital states. <coughs> we can do the same thing if we take a, a, a me metallic nanoparticle, with the, which might have 10,000 electrons. But, it, but when I have a plasmon excitation, all of the electrons behave together and oscillate as if they're one enormous wave function. <coughs> so I can take one sphere and the other sphere, maybe 10,000 electrons each, bring them in, get in, in interaction with each other, and I can create two different states that correspond to this pair of nanoparticles that would have distinct energies relative to the individual states. And that same idea holds for this core shell topology that I just, just described. <coughs> so I can have a Gedanken experiment where I, I think of a sphere and a cavity, and so a shell is basically the hybridization of a sphere and cavity resonances. And so the thickness of the shell then controls how well, the, how closely, how, how I can tune the interaction between the, be, between the cavity and the, and, and, the, and the shell primitive plasmon modes of the structure. And therefore, since I can tune the interaction through the thickness of the shell, I can tune the color of this nanoparticle by controlling that, the thickness of that layer. So why are plasmonic nanoparticles so interesting? They're interesting, so the fact that they have this very, very strong interaction with light at resonance is quite interesting. So on resonance, they interact strongly with light, which means they heat up. So they're always, they're, these are not emissive particles. We're used to seeing images of quantum dots where we have this beautiful emissive properties. These do, the, the light that they emit is at such a low efficiency quantum yield of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6, <clears> that we don't even, we, at this point, we don't really want to consider the, any light emission at all. But what we do can consider is the fact that the photons that they do absorb, they dissipate non-radiatively, which means they dissipate as heat. And because they can absorb a lot of photons, they can, be, they, they can heat up to quite substantial temperatures. <clears throat> Another thing that can happen when we shine light at resonance is that we excite the electrons in the metal to relatively high energies. And if this metal has molecules on the outside, those high, those high energy electrons can tunnel over to the orbitals of a molecule sitting on the surface. And so we can actually do chemistry on molecules based on exciting the plasmon resonance of the nanoparticle. <clears throat> so intense local fields, because we have this oscillating cloud of electrons with respect to a positive ion background, one effect, another effect, hot carriers, and another effect, photothermal heating. All of those are the three, pr three predominant effects that allow us to actually use these not as passive markers, but as active particles that allow us to, to facilitate specific processes. So the two that I'll be talking about today are photothermal applications and then also photocatalysis. So <clears throat> back when we first made nanoshells quite some time ago, we, it was very easy for us actually to tune the resonance just to the red of, of the of visible wavelengths just beyond what the eye can see. You can barely, barely see uh, see light at the wavelength of 800 nanometers. But that, uh, that, that region of wavelengths is a very important region. It's known as the water window. <coughs> so it's of tremendous physiological importance because you and I, we're all basically bags of water. And so uh, at 800 nanometers, this is a region where water is, is, is is, is quite transparent. <coughs> Tissue uh, does not absorb light. It still scatters light at this wavelength, but it doesn't particularly absorb. <coughs> and of course, blood is transparent, and so this is a window into the body. <coughs> this was first identified back almost 20 years ago. Now we know there are actually four water windows that go further into the infrared. Some of them are used for brain imaging, but this was the first one. This was the only one people knew about at the time. It was very easy for us to tune our nanoparticles to be very strong absorbers of light in this region where we are most physiologically transparent. <coughs> so I had a, 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 a collaborator, a bioengineer collaborator. I'm the nanoparticle person. She was the mouse person, since that's what bioengineers do. <laughs> and so we decided to collaborate on, 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 on uh, several different ways in which we could use nanoparticle, to use, use nanoshells and exploit this water window for different applications. So very quickly, we came up with this idea that we could use this for cancer therapy. So if you start with a mouse, and the mouse has a tumor, say, growing on the flank of the mouse, you can take nanoshells, inject them into the tail vein of the mouse. They circulate for several hours, and they take up naturally 
in the tumor of the mouse. You might say, why does that happen? It happens because tumors, you know, cancer cells have a much faster metabolism than normal cells, and so when a tumor grows, it produces a va blood vessels, a vasculature that is much, that, is, that grows very rapidly, and it's very chaotic. So it has dead ends, it has open regions, and so any particle that's around, that, that's less than about 300 nanometers, any particle, if it circulates through the blood and there is a, and there is a, a tumor, will take up naturally, will deposit naturally in the tumor site. It does not need an antibody. It does not need any specific chemical markers. It's a physical process. And it's been used for decades, by the way, for delivering different types of cancer drugs. <coughs> so the idea is then you have to use the nanoparticles circulate through the body. <coughs> they take up naturally in the tumor site, then you can shine it near infrared light. It passes right through the skin, not absorbed at all. The only thing that absorbs is, is the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles absorb the light, they convert the light to heat, and so they induce cell death in the tumor. And so you can see the illustration here on the day of treatment. You see uh, a, a very well-defined tumor on a, on a mouse, and by day 12, you see that the tumor is, is gone. This was happening in in, in literally 100% of the cases that we already tried this, so they were very excited about it. There's a little scar tissue on, by, by day 12, but by day 14, that scar tissue is gone. <clears throat> so we were, not only were we excited about this, but it caused an economic crisis because when you do a, 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 study, a cancer study with mice, you never expect them all to survive. And when they survive, you have to feed them and house them for the rest of their natural lives. <clears throat> so. That, that encouraged us tremendously to pursue how we could go from mice and animal studies and do all the toxicity studies and so on necessary to taking this into human beings or what we call taking this into the clinic. So <clears throat> these nanoparticles are, are, are very well described as, as, as safe. We were studied extensively for about five years. <clears throat> and so uh, they have been in humans for more than a decade. So we started first with a rare type of cancer, head and neck cancer. It's very slow patient recruitment. <clears throat> and while this very slow uh, uh, um, clinical trial was proceeding, we had the opportunity, we is a, a, the company that Jennifer and I started called Nanospectra Biosciences that uh, is pursuing all the clinical work. <clears throat> so they had the opportunity to study prostate cancer, and I'll say more about prostate cancer in a moment. And but they, because it's a very common cancer, they were able to do all of the studies, recruit all the patients and do all the studies within just a few weeks. But the results weren't very good. And it's very interesting, as you'll see in a moment, uh, there, sometimes one technology has to wait for another technology to be developed in order to really realize its full potential. So let me first tell you a little bit about prostate cancer. <clears throat> so prostate cancer is the second most common cancer relative to skin cancer, and it is also the second most deadly cancer relative to lung cancer. It is very common. This is, of course, prostate. the prostate gland is only in men. It, it surrounds the urethra. I'll say more about the, 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 the anatomical aspect of prostate cancer in a moment. <clears throat> but it is very common. One in nine men will be diagnosed during their lifetime. And usually older men have to worry about this. But if you are a young man and you have a primary relative like your father who's been diagnosed uh, with, with prostate cancer, then your chance of of also being a, a, a of also uh, uh, experiencing prostate cancer is actually rises quite high, it rises to one in three. So it's something that everyone needs to be very, very aware of. <clears throat> so I'm aware of this because my father was diagnosed with, with, with uh, prostate cancer actually at age 85. So I had to help him quite a bit with understanding the, all of the treatment. So <clears throat> what happens is first there's a diagnosis. Usually people measure in the blood a PSA level, which is prostate specific antigen. <clears throat> and then people perform a needle biopsy. And once, the, once there's the determination that there is prostate cancer, then the doctor goes into a mode called active surveillance where they just want to make sure it is not increasing. But then once it is increasing, they go through conventional treatment. And one of the problems with prostate cancer, <coughs> many people say you don't die of prostate cancer, you die with prostate cancer, but that's not true. It is a very deadly cancer. But one of the problems actually is not mortality as much as what doctors call morbidity, and morbidity means side effects. The side effects of treatment are, from, in many ways, worse, than, worse than, the, 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 than the cancer itself. So the side effects that involve incontinence and ED are, uh, occur at a very, very high rate, and so they are such, at such a high rate that they also make the treatment itself a uh, suicide risk. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there was a prostate cancer treatment 
uh, a prostate cancer trial that happened uh, about, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, and the results were actually not very good. So why would that be? Well, until 2012, this is what a prostate looks like. So a prostate, as I said, is a gland. It's in men only. The diameter of this gland is roughly spherical. The di diameter is two and a half centimeters, and it surrounds the urethra. What you see, <coughs> uh, what, what you see here, if I can turn on my pointer, what you see here is actually the rectal wall. <coughs> and, um, but you don't see anything inside. So it took a breakthrough in image processing. So a, a group of researchers at the National Institutes of Health in, 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 uh, in, in the US were able to use a method where they could take MRI images obtained in an MRI tube and combine them with ultrasound images and fuse them such that with very, very high accuracy, <coughs> they could be combined all in one particular imaging, uh, imaging scenario so you could very, very clearly see the interior of the prostate. <coughs> and this is used by uh, uh, Philips and Siemens, both developed commercial systems such that now <coughs> uh, one, uh, one can actually, a doctor can visualize the prostate, visualize the internal region of a prostate and identify a suspect region such that they can perform a needle biopsy only in this region that looks, that looks suspect. That is called a fusion biopsy and it revolutionized the diagnosis of, uh, of, of um, prostate cancer. It increased the accuracy of diagnosis by more than 50% and uh, has been absolutely transformative. So one of, the, uh, one of the individuals that was on this team of young researchers that developed this method was a fellow named Art Rostenhod, who then became a, a, a doctor at a research hospital in New York City. <coughs> and he realized, if you have this, now that we have this imaging tool that he helped develop, if you, can, if, if, if you can place a needle there to do a biopsy, you could also place an optical fiber in this precise region. <coughs> and in the presence of nanoshells, which are required to keep the, to localize the heat just to that very, very, very uh, concentrated region, you then can actually perform uh, therapy. So with the help of some other, another person in the team, Arvin, Arvin George, who is at the University of Michigan now, <coughs> and Stephen Canfield, who's, at, 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 who's in Houston at UT Health Sciences Center and knew about the developments of, uh, of, the, of, of nanoshells and nanospectra, <coughs> they were able to come together and develop a, uh, develop a protocol. So the idea is rather than relying on conventional therapy, before you get to conventional therapy, you can actually use nanoparticles in light and what people like to call orlays therapy, and I can show you in a moment what this is like. And it's drug free, right? So there's absolutely, this is not drug delivery, there's no drugs whatsoever involved. It's a physical process, not a chemical process. So, take the place. Oralase therapy is an investigational device for the precise thermal destruction of lesions in the prostate. The therapy is based on the unique properties of proprietary gold microparticles called orishells. These inert, non-toxic particles are approximately 150 nanometers in diameter, or about 50 times smaller than a red blood cell. In the first stage of oralase therapy, a solution containing aura shells is infused into the bloodstream of the patient, allowing them time to collect in the lesion. Most cancerous lesions have poorly formed blood supplies, leaving small holes in the blood vessels that the aura shells are small enough to pass through, leading to an accumulation of the particles in the target area. In the second part of the therapy, Laser light is applied to the lesion previously located using MRI. Using an ultrasound probe and the images from the MRI to guide the physician, a trocar is placed into the lesion, distant from critical structures. A fiber optic catheter is inserted using the cannula, precisely where treatment is desired. When the laser is fired, the aura shell particles near the laser fiber absorb the laser light and become hot, raising the temperature of the lesion to a point where cell death occurs. After the procedure, the body reabsorbs the dead tissue and the lesion heals. Okay, so the, the, the procedure that you just saw, that, which is basically identical to what happens in mice, is just scaled up for, for, for humans, was performed in the, the first set of, um, the, first, the, the first clinical trial was completed this past, uh, this past July, so 45 patients were treated. <laughs> Let me just sort of walk you through how this works. So patient number one, his name is Martin Feeney, he showed up on Monday and he got his nanoshell injection. He shows up on Tuesday and they perform exactly the procedure that I showed you. And for some strange reason, he decided to ride a bike on Friday. He didn't seem to have any particular, particularly strong effect. He had uh, 
uh, uh, improved urinary flow, and he even had a romantic weekend with his wife, which was much more information than we needed at the time. <coughs> so, um, uh, so, 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 so as I said, this, this tri trial was completed, and the success rate was very, was very high, and so this is moving, so this is moving forward. <coughs> I just want to show this very briefly because this shows you, as I said, the entire diameter of this gland is two and a half centimeters, so you can see in a case where the tumor region is actually very close to the urethra, it's within a few, just a few millimeters of the urethra and a few millimeters of the rectal wall, uh, organs that you absolutely do not want to damage or perturb. <coughs> so this is not done with a high intensity of light, this is done with a very low intensity. If the nanoparticles were not there, there would be no heating at all. So it's a, it's a very much a nanoparticle driven, uh, driven procedure. Now to change gears completely, <clears throat> how can we use plasmonics for, for, for solving one of the important pro global problems, and that is that we have one billion people in developing countries that do not have access <clears throat> to clean water. And if you look at clean water, uh, if, if, if you look at conventional water purification methods, there is a problem with them, and that is <clears throat> that they all consume a lot of energy. So they usually build in very big facilities. <clears throat> it would be nice to have a small portable facility that you could actually, where you could, might be able to directly use solar solar energy, for example, to, um, to, to, to provide some sort of local solution for, uh, for water treatment. <clears throat> so what we did was we looked at a very old method that civil engineers have known about for f at least 40 years. It's called membrane distillation. Let me explain to you how it works. <clears throat> it's still called the technology of the, of the future because it's very, very inefficient. <clears throat> so you have a membrane. You take a, a hot salt, this is for, say, for example, desalination, so let's just talk about the context of salted water. You take hot salted water and you flow it along one side of the membrane and you have cold purified water on the other side. And this delta T then sets up a vapor pressure difference, which even if it's just a few degrees, is enough to vaporize the water on one side and condense it on the other side of the membrane. So you can already see why this is an energy intensive process because you have to heat all the input water and the heat capacity of water is large, as you know, <coughs> so this, uh, this is, uh, consumes a lot of energy. So instead, if we then, <coughs> if, if, if we take the same membrane idea and we coat it with a porous membrane with plasmonic nanoparticles, now we need super cheap, we don't want to use gold, so we use carbon black, which is basically graphene in amorphous form, <coughs> it's also a plasmonic absorber and absorb solar radiation very well. We can put in cold water and then use sunlight combined with the nanoparticles to heat just within this very localized region here, within the input face of the membrane, and then we develop our own delta T so that we can evaporate and condense on the other side. And so this works, it's a purely solar process, it's direct solar process, no solar cells involved in this, just, just uh, pure, um, uh, <coughs> pure direct, uh, Des, uh, desalination. So we, we built a little system and we took it outside, <coughs> and then to see how this behaves compared to, uh, compared, for example, to, to the conventional membrane distillation, when you have to heat the input water, then you have, the, the as, as the water flows, delta T goes to zero. Once delta T is zero, nothing happens. <coughs> but when you heat using sunlight, then as you flow the membrane, the larger you make the membrane, the more water you're going to distill. And so this, so the process scales up where the conventional process doesn't scale up. <clears throat> and if we take our, our numbers and we project to something, not a solar panel, but a desalination panel, if we made it one meter by one meter, we could actually produce the World Health Organization requirement of, for three, peer, three persons with zero use of fossil fuels. So it's something that could be portable and taken anywhere. <clears throat> so the last topic I want to talk about is the, one of the biggest problems on the planet in terms of how we use energy. And Thomas uh, Ebison uh, alluded to this earlier, <clears throat> but let me tell you the story. So I live in Texas, and down the road for me, about 40 miles, is that enormous, enormous chemical plant. It's the Dow Chemical Company, and I visited there one day, and they told me one of their reactors can power Chicago. We spend an enormous amount of energy worldwide making the chemicals that we use for the materials and for all of the different things that we, that, that, that we need. <clears throat> And so this is a number, that, so the we don't keep track of this energy because the chemical industry has their own energy grid. They are not required to report these numbers to us. They report them about once a decade. So in a decadal study, <coughs> they reported this number that their total energy bill was, was basically the equivalent of the total daily consumption of Australia. And we'll hear about Australia in the next talk. <coughs> so, <coughs> what are we doing here? 
Okay. <coughs> so, so one really clear example is in the production of ammonia. <coughs> Uh, and, and this was, uh, and, and Thomas mentioned this also, we need ammonia to live. We need ammonia for fertilizer to, to, to feed our hungry planet, but it has a very large uh, energy consumption. About 5% of the world's energy goes into this process that was invented about 80 years ago, uh, more than 80 years ago, and, um, and, and, and has not really improved. So if we can figure out some way to do chemistry with less energy, we will really uh, have a very significant impact on on our planet. <clears throat> so the problem, with the, the, the problem with chemistry is that typically it's done at high temperature and high pressure, these industrial processes, uh, <clears throat> and even if, you, if, if, if you make the chemical that you want, you often make lots of other chemicals and just separation. So Jennifer Dion talked about separations yesterday, which is an enormous problem. 20% of all energy used for manufacturing in the United States just goes to separating chemicals. So <clears throat> these, are, these are huge, huge energy sinks, and we know Mother Nature solved this problem over two billion years developing enzymes. We don't have two billion years. We have to do this faster, so we can't really take the, the, the biomimetic route. We have to take a more bio-inspired route. So I mentioned earlier that, that plasmonic nanoparticles, when you, excite the, <coughs> when, when you excite the plasmon, the plasmon will decay by generating hot electrons. Those hot electrons can transfer to molecular orbitals and they can actually induce chemistry. So I'm going to show you a very simple reaction <coughs> of, of hydrogen H2, hydrogen molecule, which is a very, very stable molecule. It takes many electron volts to separate, to, to dissociate this molecule. If I put an electron and I make it H2 minus, I lower this dissociation barrier by several electron volts, so I can actually dissociate it with light and nanoparticles at room temperature. <coughs> so let me show you the cartoon. I flow, uh, I flow H2 over a gold nanoparticle surface. It very, very weakly associates with the surface. I shine light and excite the plasmon. The plasmon then, uh, that then transfers an electronic charge to H2. H2 becomes H2 minus, and it separates at room temperature. <coughs> so, uh, so that's a very exciting, a, a very exciting uh, 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 opportunity. How can we take this to, more, uh, to a more practical end? <coughs> well, we can, of course, start with our optical antennas, because we know that's a great way to deliver light. But the problem with all of those metals is that they don't interact very well with other chemicals, right? And they're known for being inert. They stay shiny. <coughs> so these are weak, very weak catalysts, and if you talk to a chemical engineer, they'll just laugh at you unless you say, well, these are the catalytic metals, right? But these metals don't even interact with light very well. So how can we get, combine the two and make the best of both worlds? And <coughs> so we can take an antenna. So in this case, we'll use aluminum, another very inexpensive metal. <coughs> and we can put uh, reactive sites, so we call it an antenna reactor, and we can create that complex, and then we can, uh, then we can do chemistry where, where we have the specificity of the reactor, and we couple in light. So we can do light-based chemistry this way. <coughs> So here we use an aluminum uh, palladium antenna reactor, and we do the same experiment I showed you where we dissociate hydrogen. <coughs> we do this just with, in this case, aluminum nanocrystals work as well as full nanocrystals. <coughs> but then when we do this with an aluminum palladium crystal, we find that actually the rate of dissociation increases by 100 times, so two orders of magnitude, because of the presence of the combination of both the antenna and the reactor. So <coughs> we also then we want, let's, let's look at a, a, a bit more of a, a complex uh, chemical reaction, and that is the dissociation of ammonia. And you might think I'm crazy. I just told you how important it is, how much energy we spend making ammonia. So why in the world would I dissociate ammonia? I'll tell you in a moment. <coughs> so here we have another antenna reactor. We have a copper antenna with ruthenium sites for a reactor. <coughs> and this uh, allows us actually to dissociate ammonia, again, with incredibly high efficiency, uh, even though this is a, rea a reaction where we have, to put in, we have to put in a lot of energy to do the decomposition. So what we do is <coughs> we, the, the combination of the antenna and the reactor will allow us to lower the barrier height in a very controlled way. So we actually, through this study, we can actually figure out how much is con how, how much heat contributes to the chemical process and how much the non-thermal reactivity of having a hot electron dissociate the molecule uh, corresponds to the process. So what I'm showing you, so for example, this is, this is basically the, the activation barrier for the chemical reaction. And these black lines are basically the chemical reaction in the dark. So we follow the Arrhenius function. 
But the Arrhenius function is also a function of light, because this is a light-induced reaction. <coughs> so here I have the reaction in the dark. And then as I, um, at, so, so this is the reaction barrier. And as I begin to turn on light of different wavelengths, I lower the barrier. So the slope going down means I'm lowering the barrier of the reaction. And I, as I change the wavelength of light, I find I actually have, I, I reach a minimum. I have a very, very low barrier for this particular wavelength of light. I stick with that wavelength of light. I then turn on my laser, and I check, and, and, and I look at how the reaction changes with intensity. And as I increase the intensity, I find that I lower the reaction even further. And that's what this beautiful curve is. This is the reaction barrier in the dark. And as I turn on light, the reaction barrier goes down. It goes down the most at that special wavelength, and it goes down as a function of intensity. So, so, so now I, I actually have, a, a, at this particular wavelength, I can actually lower the reaction barrier from 1.2 to 2, to, 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 but by almost an entire electron volt for that, for that process. <coughs> so um, same, just to, just to uh, change gears but follow the same topic, what do these companies have in common? So these companies are interested in fuel cells. So fuel cells have something, very, have something in common. Fuel cells, basically, very simple device. You need hydrogen. Now, you've heard about the hydrogen economy. I've heard about the hydrogen economy. I've heard about it for years. So what does that mean? Can we really have hydrogen-fueled uh, vehicles? They exist, and they have been made, and they're, they're commercial. <coughs> uh, Toyota makes trucks as well as vehicles, but nobody has them. Why don't they have them? They don't have them because hydrogen is too expensive. Now, I just showed you a minute ago about dissociating ammonia. So, so ammonia is actually, if I transport ammonia, that's the safest way to transport hydrogen. So knowing how to dissociate ammonia is actually very important. And Toyota is very, very interested in, in that safe way to, to, to transmit, to, to, to transport hydrogen. <coughs> So hydrogen, as it is, is very, is, is very expensive because you have to follow this very in, in energy-intensive industrial process. <coughs> so, so for example, at a chemical plant, this is the standard way of making hydrogen. I use a process called steam methane reforming. <coughs> and you can see what the cost is per kilogram. Another process, electrolysis, is also even more expensive. These are not comparable to fossil fuel. If they were comparable to fossil fuel, we could switch over to hydrogen and go away from the carbon economy uh, and, and make a, a huge impact. If I have to deliver hydrogen, it costs even more, because hydrogen transport is very, very difficult. <clears throat> so all of these expensive numbers actually tell me, because I have to do this chemistry at high temperature and high pressure, it costs a lot to have equipment that runs our chemical reaction at very high temperature and high pressure. That's why I have these big chemical plants in the first place. So if I change over from the uh, traditional way of making hydrogen, so this is the actual chemical reaction for those of you who are, who are interested, <coughs> you start with methane, and in this case water. You can also do methane and CO2. Methane is, of course, a greenhouse gas. We'd like to get rid of it. <coughs> and you can produce hydrogen, and you can mineralize the CO, so that's not a problem. <coughs> so we can, we can look at this conventional way of doing chemistry, or we can do, build a light-based reactor and if we, we can do, then do the exact same chemical reaction, not at 900 degrees, but we can lower the temperature of the reaction by 700 degrees. 200 degrees Celsius is a reaction you can do in your oven. You could do it in a plastic or a glass container. So you, uh, you all of a sudden, you have really completely changes the way you can think about how one can make hydrogen. <coughs> So we actually, so, so the antenna reactor that I showed you is the key to doing photocatalytic low temperature reactions. And so there's a company that was just, that, that, that has, has just spun off this idea. And their projection for how much this would cost if you now use photocatalysis for doing the same type of hydrogen uh, production, instead of looking at these, these numbers here, you're talking about hydrogen produced by a light-based reactor, and it's much, much lower in cost, and so it is actually competitive. Plus, the equipment that you would use to produce it is much, much lower in cost. It's not millions. It's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's something you, that could be installed at any kind of a gas station. But <clears throat> what's per perhaps most exciting for the people who do optics is with optics, you can turn light on and off. <clears throat> 
and we hear about hydrogen on demand. You can't turn a big chemical plant on and off with a switch, but with light you can. And so with a photocatalysis, we turn it off, the hydrogen stops producing, you turn it on, the hydrogen uh, continues to produce. So, <coughs> so, so I'm taking you across three important stories that have to do with both society and sustainability. This is Art with Art Rostenhod with patient number one, Martin Feeney, and Martin is with his wife, Joanne, and I told you why they're smiling. <coughs> I also introduced the uh, uh, solar desalination to you. I didn't have a chance to talk to you about some of the other interesting optics there, but there's a very interesting uh, aspect of that. But I did introduce this idea of hydrogen on demand, <coughs> and the, the company that we started, this is the CEO, he actually has, they were ju just named as one of the top 10 startups in the United States to watch, so I hope you will be watching. And with that, I want to thank you very much and introduce my wonderful crew of students. Thank you. Thank you.